Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the seventh uh, webinar on challenges for bank board uh, members. I'm Thorsten Beck. I'm the director of the Frank Florence School of uh, Banking and Finance, and I would like to welcome you uh, to this event. Um, just some uh, basic housekeeping issues before I start uh, on more on the content. Um, we will have uh, some presentations, um, uh, have some questions that have been asked beforehand. And during the seminar, you will be able to ask questions and please do so during, uh, through the Q&A box, uh, not through the uh, uh, chat function. Now, this is, uh, as I mentioned, the seventh uh, online seminar in the context um, of, this, uh, of this new initiative uh, of the Florence School of Banking and Finance, the Bank Board Academy. Uh, at the end of this month, uh, we have our final event uh, for this season, there's more to come in the autumn, on uh, banks, board members and policymakers a conversation between uh, Mr. Enria, the chair of the supervisory board of the ECB and Carlos Torres Villa, the chairman of uh, BBVA. And very important, as you also just saw in the short uh, clip that we showed you, um, this uh, leads up to our two training initiatives. The first one coming up in June, uh, sitting on boards, better check and control of risks um, with the registration deadline on the 15th of May, which is uh, in uh, 11 days to be exact. Um, there's lots of information on our websites on these different, uh, the different sessions uh, and the, the, the structure of this uh, uh, this training and a second training, which uh, for which uh, registration will open later, um, on sitting on boards, better quality and uh, uh, better governance. Again, more information. Uh, actually, the only thing you could uh, you have to remember from this uh, from this long website here is fbf.eui.eu. It's actually a very uh, short and very clear, uh, easy to remember uh, website, I would think. So, um, having said this, uh, let me come to today's. Uh, seminar. Um, and uh, the, the topic today is sustainability. Now, sustainability is a big topic. Um, and uh, 75 minutes, as we have planned, would, of course, not be enough. So we focus on one specific aspect, and that's the role of banks, central banks, investors, and more uh, specifically, the, uh, the role of non-executive uh, directors on bank boards um, in this context, uh, in terms of transforming the approach of, uh, of banks, finding the right instruments, uh, policy, how to comply with new uh, standards and rules, um, and how also to respond to the demands uh, of society. Um, among the questions, um, challenges and opportunity in integrating sustainability concerns in operational activities and important strategy for banks, but also central banks and uh, investors. How can sustainability requirements be aligned with the interests of investors, shareholders, and clients? What are the instruments for central banks to address sustainability challenges, also in respect to their supervisory roles? And then, of course, most importantly, what can be the role of independent board members in ensuring sustainability in the bank's business model and strategies? Now, we have a wonderful, great um, set of uh, speakers today who will give short introductory remarks before we go to Q&A. And I will introduce the speakers in the order they will speak. Um, I will therefore start uh, with Axel Weber, who has been the chairman of the board of directors of UBS since 2012. And among many other additional tasks, he is the chairman of the Institute of Internet Finance and also a member of the group of 30. Um, many might still remember, he used to be the president of the German Bundesbank between 2004 and 2011, and before that actually a very accomplished academic. Um, Luis Pereira da Silva is the deputy general manager of the uh, BIS, of the Bank for International Settlement, and has been in this position since uh, 2015. Before that, he was the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, and he also has a long career uh, both in the ministerial bureaucracy of Brazil, but also, for example, at the World Bank. Last but not least at all, Belen Romana is a non-executive director of Santander, Aviva, and Six Group. She also used to be a, a non-executive director of Banesto, so she has uh, she really is the kind of um, um, 
a, a, a good example of an independent non-executive uh, director. And before um, these different positions, uh, she has a long has had a long career as a civil servant in Spain, but also in uh, in coordination in cooperation with uh, many international financial institutions. So again, we have a great set of speakers, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to um, giving the word to, to Axel. Over to you, please. Thank you, thank you, Torsten, and it's a pleasure to uh, be at least virtually back in Florence. Uh, I uh, really uh, like Florence a lot. I used to spend time there uh, visiting the European Institute when I was a scholar and fond uh, memories of, in particular, Fiesole and a very nice setting uh, near Florence. So it's a pleasure to, to join you this uh, today. Uh, I was asked to speak a bit about the experience in the corporate sector uh, that I have in terms of sustainability. And uh, of course, you know, uh, some of you might know in 2000 already, UBS became one of the original signatories of the UN Global Compact and committed itself to uh, its principles uh, on the environment, on labor, on human rights and anti-corruption. I think that was an important milestone in our corporate history. And actually the first thing the bank did is no commitment is credible unless you actually put it into a committee that is in charge and regularly discusses these issues. So the bank started with a committee that was then established called the Corporate Responsibility Committee. And we now looked up uh, the charter of that committee signed by the then chairman 20 years ago. It already said to determine the company's policy with respect to corporate responsibility and sustainable development. So uh, for over 20 years, uh, the bank has been uh, in this area. And actually for now five, six years in a row, UBS has been winning the Dow Jones Sustainability Leader uh, title in the financial industry because of our sustainability focus. When I joined the bank, um, and I joined the bank in uh, early 2012, as Thorsten just said, the committee uh, did exist, but it had only a few, actually two meetings a year. And one of the first things I did is I made it a regular committee that meets in the same frequency of the usual board meetings. And I allocated the time to it to be not shorter than what the bank discusses in terms of risks, in terms of audit, in terms of uh, compensation and human resources. Uh, sustainability was the fourth committee that regularly met. And uh, I took over as its chair, just to signal that was uh, a important committee. And uh, I am, as some of you might know, I am a executive director, uh, so in UBS uh, and in Switzerland in general, chairmanship of large financial institutions is a full-time employment. Uh, but of course, I'm the only non-executive, uh, I'm the only executive director, the rest of the board is non-executive directors. And it's important that non-executive directors in these committees uh, bring their view of the world. This is why we have them come in from the outside to UBS and help us be a better bank uh, for the future. Now, in the same way, we also made sure that basically not just is the committee part of the normal schedules, uh, we also have put the CEO and some of the key members, the business division heads and the risk committee member and the audit committee people in the committee itself. So uh, it was very clear from the start that whilst the board puts a big priority on that, the executive committee needs to feel the pulse of the board at each and every meeting and sustainability commitments and waving those commitments into business decisions will be important because otherwise it is a committee that is disconnected from the day-to-day -day business. And it was important from the CEO top down to the business divisions that regularly participate that sustainability discussions are not just a discussion or stakeholders discussions, but it actually is a business discussion that triggers down into sometimes tough business decisions because you need to take decisions on exclusion and on what you do and what you don't do. And that needs to be then basically implemented by management. I think uh, the, the next thing I did at the time was, uh, and it reflected the mood of the time, we added something to the title. We added culture. Uh, and it's now a corporate culture and sustainability or responsibility committee because we felt that in order to lift sustainability, 
you need to embed that into the culture of the organization and you need to have a governance body that looks at the culture of the company. And so that's what we did. And I think it worked quite well over these years. Sustainability matters have, of course, also increasingly become a focus of regulation. And uh, when we started as a former regulator, as Thorsten just said, and central banker, uh, it was important for us to keep on track with all of the new rules and regulations that would come out. Now, when it comes to banking, your usual rules and regulations that are issued by the regulators or by ministries of finance or by governments, you follow those in most of your, uh, in most of your regulatory committees. But on sustainability, there's a much wider dispersion. So we asked a third party to design as a provider, a tool uh, that would capture all key regulatory and business and policy developments that would pertain to sustainability and the financial sector. Even if we weren't aware of it personally, that tool would basically help us as an intelligent learning tool to bring this on the radar screen. And in the first year, it was uh, easy to follow. In 2013, it basically included around 100 initiatives in that year that uh, basically were regulatory developments focused on sustainability. It has grown massively. Between 2015 and 2020, on average by a, uh, you know, 100 to 200% almost annually. And we now have more than 550 uh, regulatory developments and rules and regulation come in on sustainability alone. And that shows you that according to these rules and regulation, it's not just the focus of the committee that has improved and has taken more time. It's also the staff preparing these committees and the briefings and debriefings that have really grown in sync with the rules and regulation that have embarked upon it. When I look at our 2020 agenda, the top five areas that were uh, in these regulatory development, but also in the discussions of the committee was transparency issues. It was uh, environmental risks, ESG integration, sustainable investment and climate change. And I think that basically reflects what is now the core, these five areas are the core of every corporate culture and responsibility committee meeting on the agenda that we go through. As chair of the committee, uh, it is important that you basically look at this as a societal engagement of UBS and how you can best steer that and provide guidance. So this is a committee that probably has most stakeholders within the organization. And uh, we had a pretty good learning lessons last year because when uh, we looked at what was missing in what we do, we found that basically we need to make a few more commitments in the area, for example, of sustainability. We have, as you might have also seen recently, uh, joined uh, not just the UN Global Compact 20 years ago, but basically we recently issued a net zero statement uh, on climate and we committed to the principles of responsible banking as a chair of the IAF and therefore also as a chair of UBS, I usually sit on these groups and uh, we internationally participate. And then another milestone that we developed in the last year, just to end on that, was really to go back and ask the question of, in our 160 years of history, what is the common denominator that would define the purpose of UBS, uh, the purpose of Swiss banks? And you might know that the two Swiss banks have been founded in order to finance uh, the Gotthard Tunnel and the Gotthard Railway, one for the tunnel, the other with a focus on the railway financing. And it was all about investing. And it was private investments where public investments basically did not shoulder some of these big infrastructure projects 150 or 160 years ago by now. We basically now have a corporate purpose statement that reads reimagining the power of investing, connecting people for a better world. And I think what was very important was the process with which we got to that statement, because it was really a bottom-up driven process with a lot of groups of people, almost everyone in the bank organized and uh, contributing to it. And I think it is now something that is being discussed in many of our committees, because from that purpose statement, you get a much better Northern Star kind of uh, feeling about what is it we want to do as a bank and what is it actually that we want to scale back. So looking at the purpose statement will have our people uh, to focus on what actually UBS uh, wants to do and being an asset and wealth manager foremost globally, 
That is exactly what we want to do, invest into the future, basically reimagine the power of investing because investments change in every environment. And basically the purpose is connecting people for a better world and the better world is an important commitment. And that's what keeps you going with all of these initiatives around sustainability. So I'm very glad we are where we are and I'm very happy to have this discussion. Thank you again, Torsten, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Axel. If I just, um, and thank you for sharing the, the kind of the, 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 the the, the path of UBS uh, in this uh, in this context. Uh, may, if I may ask a very brief question um, before we turn over to Luis. Um, so UBS obviously is a very big bank, and you mentioned, of course, the the cost in terms of uh, adapting to sustainability challenges, but also requirements, regulatory requirements. I mean, what would you say to kind of smaller banks um, that kind of struggle with these, uh, you mentioned over 550 regulation and rules and uh, maybe also different sets of uh, rules from the US and from uh, uh, from Europe. Um, how, how can they, what is, is there a kind of a more cost-effective way or is there for smaller banks to address these challenges? Well, here in, in Switzerland, we embarked on a system that is called differentiated regulation, where basically a lot of the global rules and regulations that have to be met by the systemically relevant to globally systemically relevant banks, Credit Suisse and UBS, do not have to be met by uh, all of the nationally uh, systemally relevant and not at all by the smaller banks. There's actually exemptions and uh, also from some of the Basel rules for the very smallest banks. And I think that helps. I mean, on the other hand, it is unfortunately such that scale in banking, despite the entire discussion about too big to fail, matters today more than it did before we started the debate about uh, too big to fail. Because now in an environment where basically competition brings down the revenues and the margins of all of the banks, also given the low interest rate environment, the costs have gone up due to regulation and many other areas, including technology investments. And with that gap between declining revenues and increasing cost, many of these firms that don't have the size and the scale uh, to meet these two, uh, to make these two ends meet are in a challenge. And, and that clearly has to be uh, considered. I think it will lead to some reg to some consolidation in the industry, but of course, consolidation is a medium to long-term trend. That's not a recipe for smaller to medium-sized banks to cope with these challenges. So unfortunately, uh, I think uh, some, some differentiation in the regulation would make sense. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Axel. Let me turn to Luis, uh, who is going to kind of uh, bring us more the central bank uh, perspective on this topic. You have to unmute yourself, Luis. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Thorsten. It's a pleasure to be here in this panel uh, with Belen and Axel uh, and you. So let me bring a little bit uh, a central bank perspective from my former position, a little bit from the uh, what I hear here and have been doing at the, at the BIS about uh, sustainability. I will try to divide this into three uh, major uh, items. First, uh, the risk dimension uh, that central banks need to address. Second, try to uh, give you a perspective of what central banks uh, have been doing on, on climate change and sustainability. And third, perhaps uh, what and, and how to communicate about it. On the first point, uh, I think the involvement, of course, uh, of central banks and the community vis-a-vis uh, -vis sustainability comes a long way. But particularly on, sim on climate change, about some of the uh, seminal pieces uh, uh, about uh, the way in which you should manage these global negative externalities, these issues of coordination, uh, public goods, negative global externalities, tragedy of the horizon, tragedy of the commons. And at, at the end, it's about risk. It's about the risk of not being capable of fulfilling the financial and price stability mandate of central banks. Now, of course, you can argue that there is a, an ethical and a social welfare dimension to address uh, climate risks, but uh, central banks uh, should also look at their existing mandates. Think of this as uh, uh, threatening, think of sustainability of climate change as a threat to fulfilling their own mandates. Now, having said that, the way in which uh, uh, we are starting to approach risk uh, regarding climate change is a bit different. 
it's not anymore the traditional financial risk uh, black swan approach that uh, is associated with very rare events, stale events. What we try to develop, particularly here at the BIS, is the concept of green swans, which is something that is certain to happen. What you don't know is exactly when and how it will happen. So it's a very dimension, a very different dimension of, of risk. It's not uh, a, a Gaussian distribution. It's, uh, it has uh, cascading effects. It has irreversible tipping points. It is certain to happen. And we have to pay attention to this because of the catastrophic effects that it might have on financial and, uh, and price uh, uh, stability. So this is one uh, dimension of it. If you think of um, uh, sustainability as something that will help you to address uh, climate change and perhaps address uh, the issue of not reaching or not going beyond some irreversible tipping points, yes, indeed, you are sort of making the, the institution, the central bank, your board, much more aware of uh, some of these systemic risks that uh, climate change uh, 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 you know, uh, bring to us. And it uh, particularly um, brings a, a dimension that uh, the wait and see, if you think of uh, these uh, events as uh, triggering uh, irreversible uh, uh, changes in the uh, outcomes for uh, financial and price stability, then wait and see uh, is not anymore a, uh, a, a tenable position. It's very risky it by itself. So you need, to, you need to act. The second point, what are uh, basically central banks doing? Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> you, you know that uh, they, they have been acting uh, individually, but more recently, many central banks have been working together in what is called the network for greening the financial system. And I must say that this has been uh, coming back to what Axel uh, was, uh, was mentioning and probably what Belen was mentioning. This is not in isolation from the private sector. This is work that is being done in terms of apprehending scenarios, apprehending uh, risk that is pretty much linked to what uh, is happening in civil society and in the private financial sector. Now, specifically, Central banks are helping to bring to this debate some public goods in terms of uh, analytical uh, uh, tools and, uh, for example, uh, improving the modeling effort uh, to, to apprehend the climate change related risk, uh, bringing tools to run uh, scenarios of resilience for the, uh, the economy, uh, improving the, uh, the traditional uh, uh, integrated assessment models related to uh, climate uh, economics, improving uh, stress tests, uh, di discussing the role of macroprudential policies. This is something that has started, for example, here in Basel with the, uh, the Basel uh, uh, Committee. And also, of course, there is a debate. I don't think it's a, it's a closed debate. It's an open debate about whether central banks can even go further and think of uh, using some of their uh, tools in terms of, for example, collateral policies to, uh, to be even more active in terms of uh, uh, setting uh, some uh, uh, rules for the usage of, uh, of assets in, in monet monetary policy. This is a very complicated uh, debate, so we might sort of revisit it. There is no uh, consensus on that. And beyond that, uh, there are also issues that are very important for central banks, which is the disclosure of exposure to uh, climate-related uh, 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 risk and, and, and assets, improving accounting standards, improving the taxonomy of uh, green investment products. For example, uh, uh, Axel was mentioning the, the ways in which committees are looking for uh, green investment opportunities. Well, it has to be done with a, a better sense of what the uh, definition of green bonds are. What is exactly the type of filters that you use when you want to build a 1.5 degrees uh, portfolio? How do you do this? There are very concrete examples of how you can green a portfolio and how it is important to, to make a shift towards precisely a different type of financial uh, culture. 
In Brazil, for example, if I remember my, my past job, uh, the central bank issued a couple of regulations since 2008, 2009 about the credit concession in the Amazon uh, area, for example, on the, in the obligation, this was in 2014, the obligation by central banks to uh, produce a sustainability, sustainability reports and have the adequate structures to address uh, climate change. So finally, third point, um, what exactly uh, and how exactly could central banks communicate about sustainability and, uh, and, and, and climate change? I think the idea, Thorsten, um, is, is that uh, there could not be a situation where the central banks uh, and boards in central banks believe that they can act alone and solve the problem. There is no silver bullet. So the, one of the important measures is the need for coordination at the local level with local actors and at the international levels. And this is obvious when you think of the variety of instruments that uh, you need to be aware of to, uh, to, read, to think of sustainability and climate change. Obviously you need to look at uh, carbon pricing and this is not in the realm of the central banking community. So you definitely need to coordinate with uh, your colleagues in the, in the treasuries, but you need also to think of uh, investment. And this is something that uh, Axel was mentioning. If you want to invest in the transition, if you want to finance in the transition, Axel was giving the uh, example of the uh, Sangotar uh, tunnel. Well, I mean, you need obviously to mobilize a huge amount of resources in capital markets, in, uh, in banking in order precisely to innovate, to do more research, to uh, precisely uh, create the necessary uh, conditions to which you are going to be able to consume differently, produce uh, differently, and think differently about the climate. So all this is, is not only the exclusivity of the central bank community, and that's why uh, the community has to act. Last but not the least, I would just end by saying that if you think of um, communication as something that sends a message, obviously uh, there is a message with uh, green swans that is a message of uh, uh, be careful uh, because these events are irreversible, catastrophic and might happen. But I think we should not necessarily only focus on gloom and doom. I think we need to focus on, on growth, on different types of growth and, and send a message that there is uh, opportunities in, in, in changing uh, the way in which uh, uh, we organize ourselves. I think that the central bank is an important actor, uh, again, not alone in coordination with others to send a, a message where there is Schumpeterian opportunities to grow in a different way, in a creative way, even if you have to sort of uh, take a, a stock of what you have done uh, be careful about uh, not continuing with the path of emissions that we are, but making sure that uh, there is awareness, there is consensus in society and, and groups such as private sector, civil society, and the central banking community work, to, work together towards this, grow, this goal of uh, better and higher sustainability of our systems. Thank you. I, I stop here. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, that was uh, quite uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, this, uh, very broad uh, discussion, but also you mentioned the different tools that uh, have been used or can be used by the, uh, the the central bank. And of course, I'm very grateful that you ended on a rather positive note. However, I'd like to follow up with a brief uh, uh, follow up question. Um, so you mentioned coordination, of course, some kind of more, I guess, orthodox people would say, well, shouldn't there be an independence of the central bank would actually kind of going into the sustainability undermine the independence operational dependence at a minimum of uh, a central bank. And more specifically, uh, could there be a kind of clashes of uh, targets so, um, or objectives? So one question that came up from a uh, participant is, um, if, the, if a central bank kind of supports a transition from brown to green assets, would there actually be a kind of a pro-cyclical element? Uh, so kind of almost like pushing a, uh, an asset boom in certain areas. On the one hand, on the other hand, it would also maybe accelerate depreciation of uh, existing loan stocks with uh, negative repercussions for financial stability. So our kind of uh, central bank, especially if they're also bank supervisors like uh, the Banco Central de Brazil, are they kind of in a tough spot that they have to, um, they see this kind of conflict of, uh, of different objectives here? 
Yes, of course. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, Axel in his former position as well has thought about this. Uh, I, I think, uh, Torstens, we, we are evolving in a, in a, in a, in a more consensus way between uh, a, a consideration where the central bank should do nothing because it, it would hurt, uh, uh, it would distort further um, asset prices and the position where on the other hand, you, you do everything and therefore you uh, consider that the distortions are helpful uh, to, uh, to combat uh, climate change. I think within the existing mandates, and of course, more and more countries are committing to net zero. So the, the political element that is backing up uh, the way in which uh, central banks are acting is coming already from uh, the political elected uh, uh, officials. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good way of, of using the existing uh, mandates and sort of saying that within this, if it is uh, uh, for preserving financial uh, stability, there are many ways in which without creating additional distortions, mm. the community uh, can, be, uh, can be helped. But of course, it is an open debate about uh, market neutrality vis-a-vis -vis other forms of uh, a, a bit more proactive interventions. You have, as I mentioned, so many ways in which you can coordinate while you can still preserve your independence that I think it's the, the best is to find precisely these ways in which the community can contribute while at the same time fulfilling its uh, uh, mandates and objectives and keeping its uh, independence. Thank you, Luis. I think so. Yes. Yeah, so, kind of a fine path between these two sides. That's uh, what we what you seem to suggest. Let me just mention, actually, before I move on to Belen, uh, that next Wednesday we have our first uh, hashtag FBF discuss on exactly that question: Should the ECB adopt an additional mandate in terms of or include in their mandate the uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, climate change? Um, so, but let me then uh, now move uh, to Belen. Um, in her role as a uh, non-executive director, and as I understand, uh, as also as a chair of uh, the risk board, the risk committee, sorry, of Santander, but also a member of the sustainability committee. So, so two uh, committees that actually also Axel referred to earlier. And uh, if you can tell us a bit about uh, your view on these issues. Thank you, thank you, Thorsten. Thank you very much, and um, thanks for inviting me to to be part of this uh, remarkable panel. So I will start with the general. Um, approach and then my own approach, my personal approach. From the general point of view, I think that, that for me the word is complexity. Uh, we have, we're facing a very complex landscape in terms of standards. You, so we have different standards across geographies, across industries. Um, so banking has not the same standards as asset management, for example. So if you do both, uh, that's, that's one thing you, you have to think about. And then the complexity of standards, if we think about the E environment, which it's mainly what we have been talking about, but also the S that has been um, mentioned, but I think that the S is increasingly uh, important. We, we really have to focus on the S and the G. So that's one level of complexity. The second level of complexity is that we have some mandatory uh, guidelines and some of them are voluntary. So you have the equator principles or TCFD or the European taxonomy. So you, you need to think of things that you need to comply with and things that you want to comply with. And then you have a large number of stakeholders. It's, it's regulators as we have seen, but we have activists, we have customers and clients, we have employees and we have shareholders. And the perspective is not the same. And sometimes it is conflicting. So that's a very complex, I think, landscape. In terms of banking, it's not, not only the increased attention by regulators, and uh, because we have the, uh, the EBA, the ECB, the, the, the um, BIAS, but we have also local regulators that, that we have to comply with as well. So as banks, we need to think of, the, of, of uh, many different levels of regulation, soft or hard. Um, and as, in, as an industry, I think that we are moving towards more collective action, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, Mark Carney's initiative has been already uh, mentioned, the Net Zero Banking Alliance, um, which I think is, is one very important uh, step 
in Brazil, for example, I was thinking of other examples, uh, banks, private banks have promoted a sustainable development program for the Amazon. So the private world is also moving into this space as well. And then we have other banking initiatives like the Banking Environment Initiative. And then the next level, which is Santander. As you were saying, I chair the risk committee and I'm also a member of the, what we call the Responsible Banking Committee. Um, and a number of things. That committee, Axel was, was saying, um, was telling about the, how the committee was founded and who is uh, part of that committee at Santander. This is a pretty large committee in terms of, um, it's not, not only the chair and the CEO are part of the committee, but also the CEOs of some of the key countries within the group um, are there and also uh, NEDs, of course. But also, the, 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 I think that, that having a committee is a, is a very useful tool to have focus, what to discuss, um, and what to face, as Axel was, was mentioning, pretty tough decisions sometimes, but also having a, um, a wide understanding of the issue. Wide understanding meaning um, public commitments in Santander, we have 11 public commitments uh, that, that include the G, for example, uh, women on the board and women in senior leadership positions, but also the equal pay gap. And also the S, you have to bear in mind that Santander, the Santander is, a, is a retail bank that is present in very different geographies, including the Americas. Um, that, that brings us a, a, a quite peculiar, I would say, uh, understanding of reality. So for us, financial inclusion is key, for example. The S is really important. Um, and things like the community and how to, how to financially empower people is also part of the commitments, but also, of course, the E. Uh, green finance, uh, carbon neutrality, all these things we, we are part of. But also, not only as a bank, but also as a client. So we have a responsible vendors policy. Vendors, which we have thousands of them, are also key when, when, when pushing the whole uh, economy towards more greener, and I would say sustainable, and I, I would really stress the social part of it. Um, if we don't think about the social, the green uh, is gonna be more difficult to, uh, to address, I think. Um, and finally, as a board member. So I think what that, that we need to think of, um, I like the three R's that Mark Carney mentioned, reporting, risk assessment, and return to investment. Um, and, and I'll post, on the return to investment. We do have shareholders as well. Um, and this is a very uh, delicate uh, balance. And I'll give two um, non-banking examples where the balance was some, somehow lost. One is Deliveroo. I don't know whether you followed uh, the IPO. They really had a problem because of the S. Um, and, and I think that it's so back to my point that let's not only think of the E, which of course we need to, but also the S or uh, Danone, where, uh, where the uh, share price was more important than the ESG, the, the ESG positioning, if you want. Um, so as a board member, we, we need to think of the balance between how to play a very good role in the role that we need to play as a bank but also um, answer the questions of very different uh, stakeholders. So, so that is for me the, the, the most difficult balance that we have to think of. And finally, it was also mentioned um, by, the, uh, by you, Thorsten, because we have different standards and that's this is an evolving, um, landscape so we will find uh, i don't know whether global standards but for more common standards we will end up having stranded assets and maybe bubbles so we again that's another area where we need to strike the balance so for me the key challenge is how to get the balance in a very very complex uh, landscape thank you Thank you very much, Belen, for this. Um, 
And by the way, um, before I'm um, just mentioning again that uh, you can ask uh, for the audience, you can ask uh, questions in the Q&A box, please. Uh, but Belen, let me maybe follow up with a uh, brief question to you. Um, so you as a non-executive director, um, two questions. One, how can you make sure that this kind of your approach in terms of sustainability actually trickles down throughout the whole operations? So it's being really adapted and it's not just on paper, but it's being actually kind of uh, developed as a culture, I think as uh, Axel, for example, mentioned. Number one, and two, I mean, you mentioned, of course, Santander is very active across the world, lots of Latin American countries, for example. I mean, how do you um, deal with these differences, for example, in regulatory frameworks, um, also in different approaches and different cultures? So um, the first question. Um, so culture is a very tough uh, issue. Uh, it's, it's easy to talk about that. It's, it's more difficult to really measure the, uh, the evolution of culture. But I think that you do have tools. Public commitments are extremely useful tools. I think it's quite helpful because the whole organization understands that, that there are common goals public, uh, publicly stated. But also you were mentioning this, the difference between the theory and, and the action, if you want. And, and I think that, that from that point of view, having policy guidelines is key. Understanding the stock where you are in terms of, for example, the credit risk and, and where you need to go and how to measure the goal and the transition. Sometimes the problem is not the end station. The problem is the transition towards that end station. So you need to think of the policy guidelines within, uh, within the, the bank in terms of where and when do we wanna get and how do we get there? So where do we, what's the starting point and how, how do we move, move there? So, and that moves the culture because the, 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 the real decisions that are made move the whole organization. On your second point, the, um, so that, that's the eternal question. It's not only about ESG. When you are a global bank, you need to face different realities, regulations, cultures, understanding of banking. So that's part of the, I would say the, the, the normal life of, of the bank where you need to address completely different levels of regulations and, and different levels of, you know, stakeholders react differently uh, in different uh, countries. Um, but I think that at the same time, that's a huge wealth. So it, it adds complexity, it makes it more difficult, but it adds wealth in terms of you learn more about how people in different, different that's the real diversity, I have to say. When you have to take into account completely different views, that is really enriching, that I really enjoy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Belen. So uh, the benefits of complexity, thank you. Um, so maybe um, if I can uh, now go to some other questions that uh, we have received. And uh, um, actually it's a question I would say, um, yeah, for pretty much anybody, but let me ask, maybe start with Axel. Um, you mentioned the 500, over 550 uh, rules, uh, regulations, and there might be another one coming uh, from the European Union in terms of the, uh, uh, the green investment taxonomy. Um, now, is that something that you would see from your view as a bank as uh, something useful or is it, does it add to, to maybe unnecessary complexity? No, look, I had the pleasure just last week to uh, discuss it with, with Commissioner Marine McGuinness on an IF forum. And I asked her exactly that question, uh, basically saying, look, uh, Europe, I think, is in a good position in the sense that Europe was the first out with the taxonomy and probably compared to the US and other constituencies has been in that field earlier and longer and more consistently. At the same time, I think the aspiration level of the European taxonomy is such that it focuses at a more absolute level of what is sustainable and what is not sustainable, investment banking, et cetera, where the US is much more focused in a more pragmatic way on financing a transition from the status quo to a better lower carbon pass 
but actually is less prescriptive on the tools and on the rules around that, as opposed to the transition financing. And actually a second element in the US, it's largely based on encouraging future research and development to play a key role in that transition away from current technology to future technologies and setting incentives to be developed. And I think Europe uh, sort of having been to the game early, uh, clearly is setting and playing a role in setting a global standard. But I think at the same time, Europe needs to be open to take developments in the rest of the world on board in order to develop these taxonomies to be open and exportable in the sense, because I can tell you one thing, not just as chairman of a global bank, but also as chairman of the IF, what we need is a single set of rules for dealing with environmental and sustainability across the globe. The worst development that could happen is like in banking and accounting that we get a US standard, European standard, and possibly other standards developed uh, in different jurisdictions. And then we will spend a decade or two, like with Basel II or the FSB, to harmonize these standards. Mm -hmm. This is a global challenge. It can only be dealt with with global coordinated action, and it can only be dealt with with global coordinated standards. And since Europe is first, it probably needs to show more flexibility than others who are still developing these standards. But I did actually in this discussion with her get the feeling that the Commission is aware of that, that mm -hmm. Europe is glad that the US with the new administration has rejoined the Paris Accord and is sitting at the table again to negotiate. And I think then we need that flexibility to also bring China in, which of course being a developing country and starting from a different energy and sustainability mix than some of the developed countries needs to be given some specific transition uh, arrangements in order to meet these global standards. So, you know, I think all three elements are important. Uh, absolute level of aspiration versus transition financing. Uh, second, flexibility around that, using future opportunities, which the US focuses. And third, allowing for some pathway, some glide paths for emerging markets to join. Uh, the same would be for Brazil and others to join that, what is basically easier to achieve at the global level for developed countries than it is for emerging markets, but they benefit more. Thank you very much, Axel. Um, a question for Luis, maybe. Um, so we talked about banks. That's, of course, the focus here. Um, but of course, banks are connected to many other elements of the uh, or the players in the financial system. So here's a question on uh, the kind of infrastructure elements, such as CCP, CSDs, uh, and their potential role in terms of greening the financial system. Do they have a responsibility or are they just executors? Um, can they take a, a certain role as well? Or is it just uh, too early to talk about this uh, kind of debate? Thank you, Torstens. Uh, thank you for the question. Just to, to, uh, to, uh, to be uh, completely in agreement with what Axel just uh, mentioned about the need for global uh, standards, the need to homogenize the definition uh, of uh, accounting standards, uh, of uh, green, uh, green products. There are some work uh, being going on at the IFRS, so there is good opportunities for that. Regarding the, the, the infrastructure for trading, I think every effort that we do in order to improve the speed with which uh, you use precisely those uh, hopefully more global standards to trade uh, green products would be a, would be a plus. Now, uh, uh, before getting into the infrastructure, I guess you need to, to get precisely into the product uh, itself. So we have, for example, been working on uh, uh, improvements in the taxonomy, but also in the design of uh, financial uh, uh, financial products. I think Belen was mentioning the need for uh, paying attention to returns. I think there is a lot of work, for example, that uh, uh, suggests that uh, returns can be actually very good when you when you focus on green portfolios. So there is a technology before you get into the trading and the infrastructure torsions that we need to develop in terms of, uh, uh, let's say green portfolios at 1.5, tokenization mm -hmm. of uh, green assets uh, and so on and so forth. So all, this, all these efforts, I guess, uh, go into the direction of uh, what uh, uh, Axel was also suggesting and Belen as well, the uh, need to, to have the standards, the need to finance the transition, the need to mobilize the resources and you need then to trade them uh, globally so that particularly 
the effort is also beneficial to uh, countries that have lower, sa lower savings, uh, less developed mm -hmm. financial markets, and so on and so forth. Now, hopefully, as we know, we are exactly because of COVID in a situation where recovery, and particularly, let's say, engineering a more sustainable recovery is in the hands of policymakers. So we don't need anymore to convince the US administration, for example, or the European Union administration that there is a need for doing that. So the, everybody is, is there. So now it is our role uh, in, uh, in the private and public financial uh, sectors to sort of find out exactly what is that we can do to deliver these practical solutions that uh, uh, policymakers now have, have accepted. Okay, well, thank you very much, Luis. Um, Milen, um, I want to come back actually to a point that um, uh, Axel already touched upon. And they're kind of coming also back to what you mentioned in terms of the richness, of course, of expectations and uh, approaches across your different host countries where Santander has uh, uh, subsidiaries. Um, are you afraid that um, banks, let's say domestic banks in one of your the countries where you have a subsidiary, or maybe foreign banks coming to Spain, uh, or other foreign banks in the same country where you have a subsidiary can kind of try to gain a competitive advantage with, uh, with a lower focus on sustainability. Is that, um, I mean, so a little bit like the concern that we had over, I guess, 40 years ago about undermining with uh, capital regulation each other. Um, could there be a similar scenario where, where a global bank kind of faces that, uh, that kind of scenario in terms of sustainability approaches? Uh, thank you. Just before we get there, uh, I will also, um, I mean, I, I really like Luisa's um, answer to your point. And, and as I'm a member of the board of an infrastructure company as well, I think two things. One is indices help. So the fact that we are creating green indices will also help drive uh, finance into a greener uh, investment, if you want. And also uh, digital assets, tokenization uh, is going to, I think it's going to also um, help a lot uh, when when developing a very liquid market for green assets. Back to your to your point. Um, so I think that more than banks versus non banks, where the difference is not that huge, I would think of banks and non banks, okay. and there you find a completely different landscape in terms of regulation and requirements in general. So um, so if you think of um, shadow banking or hedge funds or there are some um, some parts of the, of the financial industry that play with different rules um, and I think that that is 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 something that we will uh, see playing out in the in the next few years with all this uh, this different and we have seen that with technology and uh, information for example data where the rules are different if you are a bank and if you are not a bank that will also play um, with a with green revolution. Um, because I think that, that we do have regulators that, that, that care about this green revolution where other agents in the market are not regulated. So they, they will have other ways of, of getting into reality in a different way. So it's, I don't think it's, it's between banks and banks, uh, domestic or international. We all play with similar rules. I would think. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Axel, is it also your view that uh, in terms yeah, of- Yeah, uh, so I would just wanted to, to chime in actually, uh, just to put it a bit in perspective, uh, I think you know banks versus non-banks clearly is already in traditional finance and a regulatory arbitrage going on. Uh, it's not just with green finance, it, it's traditional finance as well. But look, I mean, we just have to understand the size of the challenge here. Uh, if you look at what is needed to meet the Paris Accord, you need to put more than 90 trillion of investments into sustainable finance. And just by comparison, that is the size of global equity market capitalization that we have today generated over 150 years. Uh, so domestic equity markets. It's also north of the size of global GDP, and I'm pretty sure since I looked last time, the numbers have gone up. So we need to reinvent an entire universe of green and sustainable finance that challenges and rivals traditional finance in, in itself. 
And so if, you know, to your question, is it an advantage or a disadvantage? We need to, we, we see in our sustainable portfolios, a gross factor, you know, five times larger of money from clients flowing into sustainable finance as opposed to their non-sustainable cousins. And for us in wealth management, the sustainable portfolio is now the number one choice of our CIO because that's by popular client demand. So I actually see it the other way around that if you wanna be a credible player in sustainable finance, you need to scale back in particular those parts of traditional finance that still have a high carbon content. For us, mm. our credit book now has 1.9% of carbon content uh, and our major work is to reduce that to close to zero as fast as or as as soon as we can without upsetting long term client relationship as you know as Belen said it's tough choices when it comes to reviewing client by client their carbon footprint and what that adds to your portfolio there's no question on you know uh, on our own footprint you know scope 1 and scope 2 we'll get there pretty fast you know in in 2025 but in greening our portfolio and our client book that requires a lot more work with clients for them to basically help them on their journey to sustainability. And so in a way, what you can do is you can help clients make that transition, but you can't cut them off. I think it would be the wrong decision uh, to not help clients in their transitions because that's what they look for banks for, to, for doing. So I do actually think a good carbon footprint helps a bank as opposed to competitors who don't just meet the same aspiration level. Thank you, Axel. So you're kind of coming actually back to the role of the house banker, right? As we know this in, uh, in Germany, the relationship lender uh, working together between the, uh, the client and, uh, and the bank. Thank you. Uh, Luis, I think you wanted to come in as no, well? Yeah, no, I, I, again, <laughs> I, I'm in full agreement with Axel. This is a macro issue. This is probably the most important macro financial issue of our times is to, to organize the, the transition so that precisely as, uh, as uh, Belen was and Axel was saying, you don't end up with stranded assets and potential financial crisis, and uh, you don't sort of create bubbles with, again, a potential financial crisis as well. So it's a, it's a fine line where you need to sort of, uh, to some extent, be a, a, a bit of a uh, organizer of this uh, uh, transition as smooth as possible with new green financial instruments that would fi will finance potential future growth, while at the same time, you organize the way in which you decarbonize the existing, uh, let's say, parts of the uh, production system and the financial system that have a, a heavier uh, carbon footprint. Now, uh, and you, you need to do all this uh, with some, some good news and bad news. I mean, Excel like was saying, uh, that uh, it requires a huge amount of finance. Well, you have about today uh, 30 to 35 trillion of assets under management that are under an ESG mandate. Now we know that it's not perfect in terms of definition, but the trend is growing as Belen and, uh, and Axel were suggesting. Uh, the good news also is that from a macro perspective, you do have for the moment, and hopefully you will continue having the impetus of some of the existing uh, uh, accommodative financial conditions globally so that you can sort of afford the transition in a more sustainable way from a macro financial uh, perspective. The other thing that is aligned is the, as I was mentioning, the willingness of many uh, political circles in China, in the US and in Europe to work alongside towards uh, the objectives of the Paris Accord. So, and you have on top of that uh, society's preferences that are uh, shifting. So the stars are aligned, the path is, is, is pretty much uh, mapped. Now what you need is of course, and this is perhaps the bad news, is time. Time is, is needed and we don't have much time because if we believe best uh, science, we have a fixed carbon budget that we cannot go beyond which is 420 gigatons of CO2 equivalent uh, for the next uh, 10, 15 years with, you know, and, and this budget uh, can be exhausted if we don't sort of act now. So we need to sort of do everything that Belen and Axel were suggesting with this transition within a time frame 
that is shrinking. And this is where exactly this uh, uh, need to recognize that even if we don't have the exact, the perfect instruments and the perfect knowledge about climate economics, the, the action needs to start now. It is starting, but it has to be very serious and accelerated right now because of this time constraints that we have uh, in front of us. Thank you. A very clear call for coordinated action. And actually, that kind of puts into uh, um, context, I guess, also the next question that I have, uh, and I'm going to start again with Belen. Um, so in terms of the time frame, um, so when we talk, of course, we talk about the return on investment, uh, return to shareholders, uh, typically about annual basis, we talk prudent prudential requirements, three, four, five years. And then ESG is often seen as more longer term, although, again, uh, Luis just told us maybe it's uh, actually much, much uh, more higher urgency. Although, of course, the, the end objective, uh, kind of the, when the return ultimately comes out uh, on the societal level, is uh, much farther away. How do you kind of uh, um, reconcile these different uh, time horizons, time frames um, that we are kind of uh, talking about here? Um, it is challenging, but but it's not really new. I mean, we have always faced investments that that were longer term. Any energy, by the way, investment that is it's uh, longer term, and and the answer has always been a combination of different instruments. So it's not only debt, but you also need equity and then project finance. So so I think it's a combination of different instruments that will lead us there. And and both Luis and Axel were mentioning. This we need to think of both. One is how how do we help clients decarbonize, and how do we help new technologies and uh, and new solutions to be invested in and and hence developed at a massive scale. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think we we makes it the more uh, difficult or trickier is the fact that we are we're having two revolutions at the same time. One is the green revolution, which is driven by political will, if you want, everywhere at different levels, but also the technology revolution mm. that is also impacting um, the economic structure of companies and countries, and it's uh, impacting automation, it's, it's also impacting the future of work and unemployment in many uh, places in the world. So we, we have, we're living through a very um, interesting in the Chinese way time where we have to combine very different um, vectors that are impacting reality. Um, so it is a it, it's a combination of timeline. And I think that the answer to that is a combination of different instruments that will help uh, this um, go through the transition and the different uh, time scales. But also, and again, I want to emphasize the S because the S will, will make it will legitimize the green revolution otherwise it won't be legitimate we need to help societies uh, go through this transition as well as the technology transition Tor torstens can i chip in here <laughs> of course. On, on, i i couldn't agree more with you belen i think the s is fundamental because there is a redistributive aspect to climate change mitigating policies we, and this is a very important dimension that we haven't touched upon. It, 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 we know that if you do that, if you're going to the transition, it would affect mostly poor countries first, and it would affect poor households in rich country first. And therefore, when you design policies, and even if you have the perfect set of financial instruments, you need to sort of think of what exactly is going to be the impact of such policies on the distribution of income and wealth and how it is going to be perceived by those who are going to need to adapt. So this is a very important issue that uh, perhaps is, is uh, sometimes uh, minimized, uh, but uh, we, we have very concrete examples that uh, the uh, perhaps uh, uh, opposition to some of the policies of carbon pricing, of uh, mitigation and of uh, transition comes from, let's say, people that have poor choices and have little uh, limited choices to adapt. So therefore, again, uh, in thinking of how to organize this, it's not just about finance, it's not just about central banks, the private financial sector, 
uh, insurance, uh, and of course it is with all these guys, but it's also with uh, the agents that are going to be able to create the necessary uh, maybe compensatory system through which you're going to see or mitigate the uh, potentially negative effects, the distributive negative effects of the policies that you, uh, you need to go uh, through uh, and to engineer in order to organize this, uh, this transition. Central bank and income inequality. I think uh, your colleague Augustine will talk about this uh, also in a couple of days, right? So that's, yes, yes. that's of course. You cannot disentangle all of these, right? It's obviously all somehow to, together, yes. Thank you. Um, Axel, you wanted to come on as here, did you unmute it? Uh, no, so uh, okay. look, uh, I, I think, you know, I agree with both other speakers. You will not find a lot of conflicts here between the three of us because <laughs> uh, as we already sort of in, uh, in previous uh, fora we were in, uh, mm -hmm. agreed on some of these issues. I think one aspect that uh, I, I agree to the social uh, dimension of this, uh, but you know, again, and that might be a privilege. Uh, we are a bank that, unlike, for example, Santander, uh, is not present in major emerging markets. Uh, we're sort of a, a bank that's focused on wealth management. Mm -hmm. And basically, some of our clients who are sort of the emerging middle class, the affluent part of populations, and the ultra high net worth, as we call it, the richest people in the world, they benefited particularly from uh, sort of the uh, aftermath of both the financial crisis, but also the COVID crisis. And uh, there is a big ESG and redistributive agenda that is coming up in politics. You know, as a former economist, I can tell you, uh, it was always a sure bet when you had major gross economic research that after that, there was a, a phase of redistribution uh, where some of the redistributive mechanisms were really challenged. Because growth is one thing, but it tends to happen pretty uneven. And then you need to worry about the society implications of that. And we've just gone through a phase of rigorous growth and at the same time, inequality growing larger. Uh, and I think that requires focus. And it requires focus in how you do the transitions. You know, this is what I, why I said we need special glide passes to that for emerging markets. Uh, in a way, developed countries that are, you know, take Switzerland. Most of our energy here in Switzerland is uh, renewable energy because it's strongly based on hydropower, given the sort of, you know, the mountain environment and the fact that Switzerland has many dams and lakes and, uh, you know, can, uh, can use hydropower uh, very well. We probably have to overfulfill the requirements that we need to make as an in, as a rich country and as a as a very developed country, so that we provide a faster transition to net zero at the latest by 5050 to buy some additional time for countries that are in a worse starting uh, condition, and therefore even with the same programs will not make the trans same transition in the same amount of time. You know, and so this is where it matters that uh, state contingency matters in the transitions. It depends on your starting condition. It depends on your societal development. It depends on uh, inequality within the society. And rich, affluent countries with a high level of development should overfulfill their promises here because they had a history where basically they benefited historically from different standards at the time. And that's why, for example, we're committing uh, to net zero buybacks to the past. So offsetting some of our own carbon footprint as a company in the past so that we can make commitments and basically buy time for others to join this, this uh, joint uh, journey. Thank you very much, Axel. Um, I have one last question. We're getting close to the end. Um, and um, it comes kind of back to the uncertainty that we've been discussing early and maybe throws a bit of cold water also on uh, uh, what Luis mentioned earlier with uh, different countries uh, are, are willing to cooperate right now. Um, I mean, there is, of course, uh, there's always a policy risk. And of course, uh, especially in emerging markets, but not only. I mean, we saw uh, four years ago, um, the new US administration back then pulling out of the Paris Agreement. They're back in. What happens in 2024? Um, what, or more on a micro level, what is it if uh, a government decides to either increase or reduce uh, carbon prices, for example, or introduce additional taxation? I mean, both in terms of uh, for central banks, for regulator, how can you, well, you cannot really plan for it, but how can you take this into account? But then, of course, also for banks themselves, for bank boards, how can they kind of live and uh, how can they manage this kind of uh, policy uncertainty? And I, I'm, I don't, um, uh, have any specific order? Maybe Belen, do you want to go first, or Luis, or? 
So, um, as um, I think that it, it's a key question, uh, Thorsten, and I think that that we we live in a in a in a a uncertain world, increasingly so, I would say. And second, when you are a global institution, um, you need to cope with different regulations that go sometimes different ways or, or sometimes in contradiction. Um, so it's part of the, of, it's one of the preconditions if you want to be a global agent. So you, you have advantages and disadvantages, and this is one of the disadvantages. But, but I think that, that when you have become a global agent, you, you get used to that. You get used to this having to comply with completely different uh, landscapes and political situations and political wills. So, so it's, um, it adds a, a level of complexity that is in a way already there with different things. But as, as it happens with, I don't know, taxation or accounting policies or so, so we live in a very uh, diverse world and it doesn't look like it's gonna get less diverse at all. I would say the opposite. Let's see, the less kind of, the less nice uh, type of uh, complexity, unlike the one you mentioned earlier. Thank you. First, I, I, I'm a bit more optimistic uh, okay. about uncertainty. Uh, no, of course there is uncertainty and it's related to some form of skepticism, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and let's, the capacity that the medium, or well, the belief that the medium voter will sort of uh, be, be all over the place and that we have uh, this, this, uh, this political uncertainty. I, I think that what we are observing is, uh, is awareness that is growing in, uh, in uh, societies that is much bigger than before. Think of COVID-19 as a sort of accelerated image of what, uh, if we don't pay attention to sustainability, what climate change can bring us very quickly. And I think if you, if you look at the last couple of years, uh, civil societies are increasingly putting pressure, including on central banks, to act more, much more forcefully on, on politicians, on, uh, on treasuries, on, uh, on other private sector firms. Look at the ways in which uh, uh, ma major asset managers have evolved towards a much more proactive stance, irrespective of, met, let's say, what you call uncertainty. You have uh, governments, 133 governments committed to net zero. So my take is that, yes, you might have uh, a little bit of back and forth, but the overall pressure mm -hmm. that uh, an event, a massive event such as COVID, which, by the way, is a zonos that we can relate in part to mm -hmm. the collateral effects of yeah. climate change and uh, what, what we again call the uh, green swan. I mean, these events are putting pressure and making sure that policymakers are much more focused one way or another in addressing the cause, the root causes of what uh, a society is observing. So yes, uncertainty, but with a little bit of optimism. Really? Thank you. I would like maybe to just the optimism. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, maybe just on, on a, I mean, uh, Louis mentioned uh, that uh, we have a budget in terms of megatons. He didn't talk about the price. Uh, yeah. Actually, we behaved all the time as if pollution is for free uh, yes. and polluting uh, doesn't come at a price, doesn't come at a consequence. And that's why I think we need to do three things. First is we need a common target uh, price for carbon and that price needs to increase over time in order to make that budget that we, we have uh, worth spending. Second, if countries pull back from what is known as the sustainable agenda to get there, then basically uh, they're not setting the right price uh, for this. Uh, we know if there is such an externality, we can internalize it by an adjustment, uh, by a tax-like adjustment, cross-border adjustment taxes, for example. Uh, so I do think you need a, a basically a system of carbon pricing and trading, and you need cross-border adjustment taxes in order to penalize those constituencies that don't move in sync and to reward those that do. So I do think this needs global coordination, but we're just seeing that with regular taxes. And I do think it's not that hard to do it for uh, the carbon sphere and for sustainability. We just need to use the same tools, but as Luis and, and also Bea said, we need to do it now. We don't have, the one luxury we don't have is time. And that's why we need to focus on it right now. Thank you very much, Axel. And then this, uh... I would still say a positive, optimistic note. Let me thank you, uh, Belen, Luis, uh, Axel.
uh, for the excellent conversations we've had. Uh, just for our audience to remind you, uh, next Wednesday, we kind of continue on the theme of uh, climate change uh, with our first hashtag uh, FBF Discuss. And our next online seminar in the Bank Board Academy is on the Friday 28th uh, conversation between Andrea Andrea and Carlos Torres Vida. Thank you very much for staying with us. Thank you very much for your questions. And again, thank you, Luis, Axel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Okay, goodbye.